Thank you all for joining us. There are probably few topics as vital as conversion. How to have a new heart. We talk about justification, we talk about sanctification, but how does it actually happen? I had an experience in Peru that told me clearer than any other illustration how to have this change of heart. But before we talk about that, let's ask God to be with us right now. Please kneel with me as we pray. Loving Father in heaven, Lord, as we talk about conversion, as we talk about the change we all must have in order to see the kingdom of God, I pray that I would be the first one to be changed. I ask that you would please not only be with my words, but be with my heart. Help me to speak clearly. Help me to just be a reflection of Jesus Christ. For in his name we pray. Amen. Our story begins in Peru, South America, actually in Chiclayo, which is northern Peru. We were asked to come do some medical work by a dentist friend of mine. And while we were there, we did evangelism. But on one occasion, we went to a very, very remote village. It was about three hours away from the nearest civilization. There was no electricity. There was no running water. It was very, very primitive. Certainly not what I'm used to. I'm used to a CAT scanner, x-rays, labs, things like that. But this was very different. My clinic was just one wall, a thatched fence, some benches and chairs, and many, many, many patients. In fact, there were so many people there, I didn't even get a chance to see all of them. None of them had seen a doctor before, let alone a nurse. And so they were all very eager to come and ask me their questions. Now the problem was, is that everyone wanted to see me before we left. So many times people would find a way to get ahead of their friends or their neighbors. They would kind of cut in line. And I remember one time that people even followed me to the bathroom to ask a question. So everyone was very eager to be seen. The sickest people first, uh, but of course it was hard to tell until you actually talked to them. I remember that the difficulty was that there was very few resources in the middle of nowhere with things that we would take for granted, like hygiene, sanitation, things like that, were just unknown in Peru. So what did I do? Well, I shared the eight natural remedies. You can see in this picture I was talking about water. That's a very common problem in the third world. You'd think that water would be abundant, but clean water is actually one of the greatest blessings and very often rarest blessings that you'll find in the third world. I talked to many of the people about nutrition, exercise, water, sunshine, temperance, air, rest, and most importantly, trust in God. I always pointed every one of the patients to Jesus Christ as the great physician. I prayed with every single patient, no matter what their condition, and I asked God to not only heal them physically, but to heal them spiritually as well. There was one person in this entire trip that was a little bit different. I remember they didn't follow me to the bathroom like the other people did. They didn't push or try to cut in line. In fact, most of the day they stayed at the outskirts. They stayed away from the crowd. They kind of sat in the periphery uh, with their mother and their sister. And I could only catch little bits of conversation every once in a while. I would hear, oh, I'm not that serious. Or, oh, he has so many people to see, he'll never get to me. I remember finally at the end of the day, the mother took this young girl and marched her up to the very front of where we we're having clinic. She sat her down and said, my daughter's been waiting all day. Can you please see her? And that's her in the yellow shirt. Her name is Helen, 15 years old. So I said, hi, I'm Dr. Riesenberger. What seems to be the problem today? And she said, well, I'm not sure but I think it may be my heart. I'm not certain, but 
there's problems that I've had in the last year or two. I said, well, what kind of problems? She said, well, it hurts sometimes in my chest. Other times I'm short of breath. Sometimes I pass out. Sometimes I feel like my heart is racing. There have been times that I was so tired, I felt like I couldn't go on. I said, okay. So I put in my stethoscope and I listened to her heart. But I heard the worst sound you have ever heard in your life. Normally, your heart sounds like this. Dip, 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 dip. Her heart sounded like It was a very loud murmur that I could hear. And of course, I didn't have any ultrasound or echo or any way of evaluating the heart. So I had just my ears. So I had her stand up. I had her sit down. I had her on her side. I had her bear down. I had her do all these different maneuvers so that I could figure out where this murmur was coming from in her heart. And after about five minutes of different maneuvers, I realized that this murmur was coming from the center of her heart where she had a very large hole. This hole was the cause of the sound or the murmur. And the problem is, is that the hole was large enough that the, the blood began to shunt in different directions. Normally the blood goes from the body to the right side of the heart to the lungs then back to the left side of the heart, and then back to the rest of the body. The problem in her condition is that it had reached a point where it was starting to shunt. It was going directly from the right heart to the left heart. Now the problem with that is that you skip the lungs, and if you skip the lungs, you're not picking up any oxygen. This condition is called Eisenmenger's, and it is universally fatal if it is not treated. So I began to explain the condition to her in very simple terms. And of course, she was very upset. Her mom was very upset. They were very concerned at first. But as I began sharing with them what the condition was and how to fix it, they began to have more hope. She asked me, what should I do? And I said, well, I think you need to go to the capital of your country, which is Lima. You need to talk to a heart doctor, a cardiologist, or a cardiothoracic surgeon because you need to repair the hole that you have in your heart. Or if the hole is too large, you need to have a transplant or you need to get a new heart. And so she asked me and said, well, can you do the surgery? I said, no. And then she asked and said, well, will they do the surgery for free? I said, probably not. Then she said, how will I get there? I said, I don't know. She said, I've never left my village. And so I tried to encourage her and I said, I will talk to my friends in the States and we'll see what we can do. And then she said, is there any other way? Can I just drink some water? And I said, well, I don't know if that's going to help your condition, but it's always good to drink enough water. So she talked with me for a little while, asking a few simple questions, but eventually she was satisfied and she had decided that that's what she was going to try to do. She'll try to find some way to get to the capital of her country and get the appropriate treatment and possibly a transplant. As I was talking to Helen, the Lord kind of impressed upon my mind the experience that she was going through mirrored exactly the experience of salvation. In fact, conviction came to me as God impressed me that I needed a new heart. If you have your Bibles, please open them. We're going to start at a very famous verse, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. God is the great transplant surgeon. He gives us the promise of a new heart. He promises to take away our old heart, which is sick and dying, 
and give us a new one. Helen was in the middle of nowhere, Peru. What are the chances of someone who's a physician with the ability to diagnose this condition to run into her in the middle of nowhere before she dies? Pretty slim odds, I would think, right? But if you understand the very first step in the plan of salvation, it's very good odds. The first step in salvation is actually a step that is taken by God himself. God takes the initiative. God makes the first move. God searches for us. In fact, God is searching for you right now. In a thousand ways and through a thousand means, he is trying to get your attention every day. It could be through a friend. It could be through a coworker, a family member, a teacher, a mentor, perhaps a DVD, a sermon. It could be through a simple email or perhaps something that doesn't even seem like an appeal from God at the moment. But God is constantly searching for you. I believe with all my heart, he sent me to Helen that day. Luke chapter 19, verse 10 tells us, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. God was searching for Helen, and he sent me to help her. John chapter 12, verse 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Now, the word men in that passage is supplied. The way it is supposed to read is, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. Jesus draws everyone to himself. Sometimes we're tempted to think, well, should I really give this person a track? Should I really witness to them about God? It seems like they're not interested. It doesn't matter if someone grows up in a church. It doesn't matter if they have any religious background. God is drawing everyone to himself. Jesus Christ, by his sacrifice, draws not only human beings, but the heavenly worlds, the unfallen worlds. He draws all to himself. This is from Desire of Ages, page 516. Jesus knows us individually and is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He knows us all by name. He knows the house in which we live, the name of each occupant. At times, he has given instructions to his servants to go to a certain street in such a city to a certain house to find one of his lost sheep. Is it possible that God sent me just for Helen? It's not only possible, that's how God works. He is willing to send you just to find one of his lost sheep. And I believe with all my heart, he sent me for Helen that day. He sends people for you too. Will you listen to them? Will you hear them? Where did Helen spend most of the day? At the outskirts, right? She spent most of her time just watching, just observing, not getting too close. Many of us are like that with God. We want to be spiritual, but not religious. We want to kind of stay on the sidelines, not fully commit ourselves, one way or the other. But what would have happened to Helen had she stayed at the outskirts all day? She would have died. If she had never come forward, I could never have diagnosed her. If I never would have diagnosed her, she never would have known what was wrong. If she never would have known what was wrong, she could not seek for the cure. And if she did not seek for the cure, she would die. So the second step in the plan of salvation is that we must respond to God. God makes the first move, but you must respond to his initiatives. Helen actually had to come forward and ask for help. You and I have to do the same. We have to make a decision to come forward. 
to come to God, to ask for help. Revelation 3.20 tells us, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, this is a very important verse because God is knocking at the door of every single heart, every single one of us. But consider this. Have you ever seen paintings of this verse, of Jesus knocking at the door? Perhaps some of you know who Harry Anderson was. He's a very famous artist. And if you look closely at different renditions of this verse, you'll notice that there is one thing in common. You look closely at the door of each one of these paintings, and you'll find that there is something missing in each one of the paintings. What is it? If you look at the outside of the door, there is no handle. This teaches a vital lesson spiritually. There is no handle on the outside. Jesus does not force entrance. He does not climb through the back window. He does not pick any lock. The only handle is on the inside. The door can only be opened from the inside. And that's what the verse says. If any man or someone inside hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Jesus knocks, but he does not open the door. The person who opens the door is you and I. We must make a decision to let Jesus in to our lives. We must make a decision to respond to God's drawing. Won't you let him in today? Matthew chapter 9, verses 12 through 13, tells us why most people will not let God in. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick but go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That passage reveals to us that most people do not feel their need. And therefore, they do not come to God. Only the people who are sick seek for the physician. Join me in the ER. It's about 2 a.m. I come into a room, I knock on the door and say, Hi, it's Dr. Riesenberg, what seems to be the problem? And they say to me, there's no problem. I'm just here to say hi. Who would do that to a physician? Who would do that in the middle of the night? No one does that except for people who might need psychiatric help. But I guarantee you, that the average person is not going to just come to the ER to say hi. They're going to come for one common reason. And what do you suppose the most common reason people come to the ER? It's actually pain. Pain in the chest. Pain in the head. Pain in the stomach. Pain is the most common reason that people seek medical attention. And pain can be a blessing. Pain is there to tell you that something is wrong. Can you imagine if you didn't feel any pain? Can you think of what life would be like if you didn't have any pain? Well, there is a condition that is similar to that. It's called leprosy. People often think that the condition itself eats away people's fingers or their nose or their feet. That's not really what happens. It does somewhat, but not entirely. What happens is this. When you and I get, say, a rock in our shoe when we're going on a hike, we want to just get rid of the pebble right away. That's the first thing we want to get rid of. But if you can't feel it, you might not discover that pebble until five days later when it's born a hole into the bottom of your foot and is down to the bone. The same thing is true if you're at a camp out 
and you've got, uh, you know, a metal wire and you've got your hot dog or actually your big Frank, right? And you've stuck it in the fire and you get a little bit too close. Ooh, ouch. You drop your stick, right? The person with leprosy just kind of start smelling that they're burning before they drop the stick. When you're out in the middle of the country and perhaps your foot gets out of the sleeping bag and uh, let's say some critter in the middle of the night comes up to your toe and bites it, youch, you kick it over uh, across the campsite and you kind of brush your foot off and take a look and see what bit it and then you kind of snuggle back into the sleeping bag. The people with leprosy might have a rat bite their toe, no response. It might actually eat three of them off. There is a gift that God has given us in pain. Because pain is designed to tell you that something is wrong so that you will do something about it. In fact, it's so important that some pain responses are just a reflex. Like when you put your hand on a hot stove, whoosh, you immediately take it off. You can't even think about it. Other pain responses are not so quick. Some pain responses have to be conscious. You have to decide to seek for the cure, to find out what is wrong, what is causing the pain. Can you imagine if we are back with Helen for a moment? And I told her, well, you have chest pain, so I'm going to give you some painkillers for it. You have shortness of breath, so I'm going to give you an inhaler, a puffer for it. Would that cure her condition? Absolutely not. Would it make her feel better? Well, probably it would. But it would only mask the symptoms. It might make her feel better, but it would be very deceptive. In fact, not just deceptive, but deadly. Because it would make her feel better so that she wouldn't want the cure, the true resolution of her condition. One of the things that I did with Helen is I sat and I talked with her. I explained to her the diagnosis and I told her what the treatment plan was. This is the most vital portion of the plan of salvation as far as the process of conversion. When I sat and talked to her about her diagnosis, she had two choices. She could believe me or not. And that choice is repeated in the heart of every man, woman, and child on this planet. God has given you the diagnosis. He has told you that you need a new heart. It is up to you to believe him or not. Many people who go to see a doctor actually don't believe the doctor. They want a second opinion. And believe me, you can get a second opinion. His name is the Prince of Darkness. And he will tell you probably one of two things. He will either tell you, one, oh, you're not that bad. I mean, you don't kill anybody, right? You don't like uh, murder people. You're just as good as the next guy down the street. Oh, sure, you maybe aren't quite so honest about certain things. And maybe you might watch some stuff on TV or the Internet you shouldn't. Uh, maybe uh, you know, you're not entirely good with self-control about maybe what you eat too, but oh, you're all right. You're as good as the next guy. You're as good as the next churchgoer. You're fine. The other thing the devil may tell you is that you're so bad, God will never save you. It's too late. You might as well live it up because this is the only paradise that you're going to have. Let me tell you, both of those scenarios is a lie. Neither one of them is true. Yes, it is true that we have a problem. 
we have a serious diagnosis. In fact, we have a fatal diagnosis. But the good news is, is that it has a 100% cure rate with the great physician. But the choice is up to you. You can believe God or ask for a second opinion. And that's the third step in the plan of salvation. We have to actually choose to believe what God says. God says that the whole head is sick. Your heart is faint. From head to toe, you're full of sores. Do you believe him or not? If you believe him, that is the third step in the plan of salvation. However, it is more complicated than some people may think. Belief goes much deeper than an actual mental assent to the truth. I can believe that my car will stop when I press on the brake. But believing in Jesus is so much more than that. Let me explain in John chapter 8, verses 31 to 33. Then said Jesus to who? To the Gentiles? To the Greeks? To the Pharisees and Sadducees that mocked him? That's not what it says. It says, then said Jesus to who? Those Jews, but not just any Jews. It was the Jews that believed on him. How many of you believe in Jesus? So he is speaking to you. He is speaking to his followers. He is speaking to those who believe in him. Not Gentiles, not skeptics, but to believers. And what is he going to say to believers? Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. A very common passage. However, the response of the Jews is very similar to many of us. They answered him and said, We are Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou ye shall be made free? They said, Listen, I've been a Christian my whole life. I'm baptized. I go to church Christmas and Easter. I'm fine. I give money to the church. I put my best in the offering plate. I'm fine, right? Or am I? They felt that they were secure in God's kingdom based on their lineage. Well, I'm a fourth generation Seventh-day Adventist. Well, I'm a pastor, or I'm a deacon, or I'm an elder. Why are you telling me that I need a new heart? Because Jesus said the same thing to the believers, to those who believed in him. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. So if you commit sin, you are the servant of sin. Anyone commit sin? Don't raise your hand. I already know. You're guilty as charged, because so am I. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But there is hope. Let's read on. Whoever commits sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. Well, that doesn't sound like good news. It basically is saying if you're committing sin, then you're not going to live forever. But I want you to look at that as good news for a moment, and I'll show you how. Because it says the servant of abideth not in the house forever. But do you realize that means he abides for a time? For a period of time. Jesus Christ, by his sacrifice, has purchased not only salvation for those who would believe on him, but even a window of probation for those who would eventually reject him. You abide for a time. 
No matter what your choice, you still are going to have a probationary period to make your final choice one way or the other. And it doesn't matter about your genetics. It doesn't matter about your heritage or your lineage or what church you grew up in. What matters the most is the decision you're going to make right now. The decision to follow Jesus Christ. Jesus has told every one of us, if you are committing sin, you are the servant of sin and you will not live forever. That is a very straight and hard truth for some of us to swallow. But let me present it to you this way. How did Helen know that she had a problem with her heart? She had chest pain. She had shortness of breath. She had palpitations. She was passing out. She had fatigue, right? She had symptoms that something was wrong. The symptoms told her of the root cause, which was the hole in her heart. That is the same thing spiritually. Sin is the symptom. If you find yourself falling into sin, don't focus on the sin. Go to the heart. Go to the root cause. Don't just take the inhaler. Don't just take the painkillers. Get the surgery. Get a new heart. That is the true answer. But it's good that you have symptoms. Otherwise, you wouldn't know what was happening. You wouldn't know what was going on. Is there someone listening that feels an emptiness sometimes? Perhaps when the music stops and you're by yourself with your own thoughts, do you sometimes say, is this all there is? Isn't there anything more to life than this? You know, you could even win the rat race, but you're still a rat. And you know, he who dies with the most toys still dies. There's more to life than what we see around us. If you've ever felt that emptiness in your heart, if you've ever felt that there's got to be something more to this life than what we see around us, recognize that as the voice of God to your soul. When you find yourself struggling with sin, with bad habits, with poor choices, don't focus on the choices, but recognize them as symptoms of a deeper problem. If you have a fruit tree that bears apples and you'd like it instead to bear mangoes, do you pick off all the apples? That's not the answer. You have to graft in a new root. That's the same thing with sin. Most of us just focus on getting rid of all of our bad habits and we think that that's salvation. That is not salvation. That doesn't do anything. It's only a matter of time till the fruit grows back again. If you want real change, change the heart. Just like with the tree, if you want it to bear different fruit, you've got to change the root. This is a picture that we took of Helen right after I gave her the diagnosis. Does she look happy or sad? Amazingly enough, she looks happy. Now, doesn't that seem strange? You just give someone a fatal diagnosis and they're happy? Why do you suppose that she's happy? Yes, it's true. I've given her a fatal diagnosis, but she's happy because at last she knows what's wrong. At last she knows what the cause of all the symptoms are. And not only does she know the cause, but more importantly, she knows the cure. This is perhaps the most confusing part of the plan of salvation, about the science of salvation and conversion. When people feel their need of God, they sense he's been searching for them, they come to him and they say, listen, God, I, if you're out there, I need help. I need you to change me. 
You know, I realize I'm doing a lot of things that are wrong, and I understand that you have a way of righting those wrongs. You have a different life plan for me than the way I'm going. I know I need to turn around. But they always ask me the same question. What do I do now? Yes, I'm a sinner. Yes, there's something wrong with my life. I want something different. What do I do? What's God's part? What's my part? This is the most often confused portion of the science of salvation. It's summarized by one verse. Philippians 12, Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now, it doesn't end after work out your own salvation. But the second part is God works where? In you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God is going to work in you, but you have a choice to work out what God is working in. I'll explain it this way. Can you imagine someone here in the audience just passes out, collapses? What are you going to do? Well, hopefully, you're going to see if they're all right. You try to check for their breathing. They're not breathing. They're not responsive. What are you going to do now? Hopefully, call 911. Uh, perhaps while your friend's calling 911, uh, maybe there's a friend of yours that uh, knows CPR. So they might start CPR. Well, consider this. What if you happen to be right outside of my ER? I'm a board certified emergency medicine physician. And one of your friends collapses right outside the door. What are you going to do with them? Well, bring them in, right? But can you imagine that if you bring your friend in and I called 911? <laughs> Would you find that strange? Oh, well, maybe I won't call 911. Maybe I'll just do CPR, but that's it. How would you feel about that? You'd probably be a little upset because what do you expect me to do? Everything. And if you knew that I willfully withheld treatment from your loved one or your friend, you would charge me with murder. But wait a minute. If I did CPR, I was doing the same thing as a bystander. Isn't that enough? Well, no, it's not. The reason why you want me to do everything is that I'm held to a higher standard. You know, there have been true stories of five-year-olds who have saved their parents' lives. They dialed 911, and they gave them the right information. In fact, I know of a true story where a man had a heart attack, and he collapsed, and he couldn't make it to the phone. He couldn't even call for help, just kind of weakly called out. There was no one to hear him. But the neighbor's dog actually heard him and barked and barked and barked and made sure that he got help. And he was saved and he fully recovered. I saw the man after one presentation that I gave. And I actually saw the man with the dog that had saved him. And believe me, that dog gets a lot of treats from that man. In fact, he talked about her with tears in his eyes and said, she saved my life. Now the dog, you're amazed at, but the dog didn't do much. The dog just got help, right? Isn't that good enough for me? Well, of course not. Because in each scenario, you expect that person to give 100% of their effort to save that person's life. Whether you're five years old or 55 years old, the same standard applies 100%. Whether you're an ignorant bystander or a board-certified emergency physician, the standard is the same, 100%. God expects you to give 100%.
Now that 100% may not be much if you're five. It may be a lot more if you're 55. That 100% may not be much if you don't know anything. Or it may be a very high standard if you've been in the church for a long time. That's the spiritual correlation. God expects all of us to give 100% because how what percent did He give? 100%, right? Let me illustrate it this way. Consider for a moment the infected finger. One night I was working a busy shift in the ER. I came into a room and I said, Hi, I'm Dr. Riesenberger. What seems to be the trouble? Well, I think it's my finger. And I said, um, what's wrong with your finger? Well, it hurts. I said, well, what happened to it? I don't know. Did you fall? I don't know. Did you hit it? I don't know. Did you smash it? I don't know. Did something bite it? I don't know. And I said, well, what do you do, what do you know? And the patient said, well, I remember I drank a lot of alcohol last night and I smoked a lot of meth and I passed out and I don't remember anything else. I said, okay. So I took a look at her finger. And I said, well, I'm going to order an x-ray to make sure it's not broken. Also go order a blood test, make sure it's not any serious infection. So I ordered those tests. I looked at the results. It wasn't broken. There was no evidence of gas in the tissues to suggest a very serious or life-threatening infection. The white blood cell count was normal. So I looked at her finger and I said, I think you have an early infection, something that we might call a cellulitis. So I gave her a dose of antibiotics there in the ER. I wrote her a prescription for about seven to 10 days. And I told her, I want you to take all of these antibiotics, even if you feel better, right? And if you start to feel worse at any time, I want you to come back right away. You know the routine. You've probably heard it dozens of times. So I gave her the first dose, gave her a prescription. And before she left, I said, and I want you to do one thing. And she said, what's that? I said, you've got to quit smoking, quit drinking, and quit all the drugs because it's suppressing your immune system and you're not going to overcome this infection if you're doing that. She's like, okay, I promise I will. She walked out of the door. About 10 days later, one of my nurse practitioners came up to me and said, Dr. Riesenberg, I got this horrible case. I got this lady and she's got this huge infected finger. It's like a big sausage of pus and it's streaking all the way up her arm. And I said, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, is it such and such? And she's like, yeah, how did you know their name? I said, I saw that person 10 days ago. I said, well, why don't I just come in the room with you? I'll go see him with you. So I walked in the room and said, hi, ma'am, I'm Dr. Riesenberger. What seems to be the problem? She said, oh, Dr. Riesenberger, I'm so glad you're here. I saw a doctor here 10 days ago and he just didn't care. She didn't realize it was me. I said, oh, really? Tell me more. And she said, he didn't do anything. He just sent me out of the street. I said, he didn't do anything? Are you sure? Well, I think maybe he did something. I said, well, may maybe he ordered some tests. Oh, yeah, he took a picture and took a drop of blood, I think. I said, well, um, how about any treatment? Maybe give you an antibiotic? Well, he did give me one pill. I said, how about a prescription? And she said, I do remember he gave me a piece of paper. And I said, did you fill the prescription? Oh, no, I couldn't fill it. It was snowing the next day. I said, OK. I said, could it be that this doctor told you to stop doing anything? And she said, I remember. He said, quit smoking, quit drinking and quit the drugs because it was suppressing my immune system. I said, and did you quit all those things? She said, of course. I said, when did you quit? Today. It sounds very humorous. This is a true story. So you tell me, why did her finger not get any better? Well, the answer is simple. She didn't do one thing that I told her to do. Well, I take that back. She did do one thing. Did you catch it? Which thing did she do? 
it got worse, so she came back. And that's what we do with Jesus. We come to a week of prayer. We come to camp meeting. We listen to DVD after DVD. We go to seminar after seminar after seminar. We're seminar junkies. And we wonder why our spiritual relationship is so good during that week of prayer or during that camp meeting. And then afterwards, what happens? It's worse than ever before. And you know why that is? That's because we don't do anything that the speaker says. If they talk to us about prayer or Bible study or reaching out to our neighbor or sharing our faith or witnessing, you've got to actually do what they say. You've got to follow the prescription. It's not rocket science. It's very simple. The plan of salvation is like going to the ER. What did the woman coming to the ER have to do? Well, she had to come, right? She had to tell me her problem. She had to follow my instructions. Now, she didn't. But consider this. When you ask yourself, what's God's part, what's our part, think about the woman from the ER. What's her part? And what's the doctor's part? Think about that for a moment. Can you imagine if we go back to the first time she visited and she gets her prescription, she's taken her first dose of antibiotics, she goes home and she hears a knock at the door six hours later. Who is it? It's Dr. Riesenberger. What do you want? I'm here with your next antibiotic dose. Ah, open up. Does the doctor do that? Do they come every six to 12 hours to your house to give you your dose of antibiotics? That's silly. Of course they don't. Why not? Because you can do that. Why doesn't the doctor fill your prescription for you? Because you can do that. However, did the woman order the x-ray? No. Did she write herself the prescription? No. She doesn't have a license. Did she make the diagnosis? No. She didn't go to medical school. Do you see the difference? The woman had to do what she could do for herself. The doctor would do the things that she couldn't do for herself. It's that simple with the plan of salvation. God is going to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Can you forgive your sins? No. God promises to do that for you. Can you change your own heart? No. God offers to give you a new one. Can you change your thoughts? No. However, can you decide what to put in your mind? Yes. Do you see the difference? You can decide to read, to watch, to be surrounded by things that are going to lead your thoughts to God and to positive behaviors. But you can also decide to surround yourself with bad things. The choice is up to you. You have a decision to make, but you have a part in the plan of salvation. It is not just God. God honors your choice. God will do for you what you cannot do for yourself, but he leaves for you to do what you can. Consider this. This is my first patient when I was in Cambodia. Any guesses as to what might be wrong with him? Take a close look, and you'll see that he's holding a very crooked wrist. He fell on an outstretched hand and snapped both bones, both the radius and the ulna playing soccer. Consider for a moment the plan of salvation like this eight-year-old boy. We come to God and our lives are crooked. They're out of place. And then the first thing that's going to happen is I'm going to make it hurt worse. Oh no! 
So I slapped some iodine on his wrist, and boy, he hollered at that point. And sometimes, that's what it seems like God's doing. We bring our lives to Him, and then instead of less pain, we have more pain. Instead of less trials, we have more trials. Instead of struggling less, we are struggling harder than we've ever struggled before. But that's how the plan of salvation is. Sometimes you have to go through some pain to find full relief. So I put some iodine on his wrist, and then I, he calmed down a little bit. But before we come back to him, do you know who this is? This is a young man named Aaron Ralston. Aaron Ralston illustrates this step of the plan of salvation. He was hiking in the middle of nowhere when a large boulder came loose and pinned his right arm to the mountainside. In just a very few moments, he realized he had just two choices. One choice was to wait and hope someone would come by so that he could get help. That was unlikely. There was no one for days near him. His second choice would be to take out his knife and do the unthinkable and hack through his arm to freedom. Now, Mr. Ralston doesn't acknowledge God in any of this. To my understanding, he is not a converted Christian or anything like that. But the picture is worth a thousand words. Mr. Ralston made the decision to sacrifice his own arm in order to preserve his life. How about you? Would you make the same decision as Mr. Ralston? But let's consider not just physical life, but eternal life. Would you make the decision to cut off anything, no matter how dear, in order to save your body? Would you? People with cancer, they undergo radical surgeries in order to save the body. That is the same illustration spiritually. Jesus Christ, when he talks about sin, he speaks of us having to pluck out an eye, to cut off our hand, to cut off our foot in order to save our body. Now, that's not literal, but the point is very clear. Are you willing to cut out something from your life, no matter how dear, for the kingdom of God, to save your soul? Mr. Ralston was more than willing to save his physical life, but are you willing for eternal life? Our young little patient was a little shaken up after the iodine, but that's only the beginning, because if you look carefully at what's in my hand, I've got a big needle, and I put that needle right at the fracture site, and boy, if the iodine hurt, this hurt three times as much. But after I put the lidocaine, which is an anesthetic, into the fracture site, he actually felt a lot better. And in this picture, he said, wow, it doesn't hurt at all. And then I took his wrist and I went, <laughs> and I relocated it, and he was like, it hurt again. But after I put it into place, I molded it with plaster to conform to the right shape. Because I put his arm back into place, but without the plaster, if I'd send him out, what would happen? It'd just go right out again. And that is the plan of salvation. God not only wants to put our life back in place, He wants to keep it there forever. That's justification and sanctification. God just doesn't want to forgive your sins. He wants to keep you from sinning. He doesn't just want to change your behavior. He wants to change the heart so that you won't want to do what's wrong. He doesn't want to have a change for a moment, but a change for a lifetime. That's the same thing with my eight-year-old patient here. I not only put the bones back into place, but I molded the plaster around his arm in a right fashion, in an anatomical position, so that the bones wouldn't just go into place for a moment, but they'd stay there forever. 
Once I got it in the right place, I pulled one last time and got a really good pop. They got an x-ray a few days later. Both the bones were in perfect alignment. But after a few days, in fact, after a few weeks, when they looked at his arm, there was an area where you could tell where the bone was broken. It was a fracture site. It was a small area, a little divot, where the bone had been broken. And did you know in that area, it's actually stronger than ever before? That area where it broke is not the weak point. It's now the strongest point of the bone. That's what God wants to do. He wants to take us sinners, weak, erring mortals, and make us stronger than ever before in the very area where we fell. John chapter eleven thirty nine, 39, very critical verse. Take ye away the stone. Who said that? It was Jesus. Who was he talking to? The people who were standing by. Is this out of context? No, it makes perfect sense. Listen to this. Desire of Ages 535. Christ could have commanded who? The stone to move. And it would have obeyed his voice. He could have bidden the angels who were close by his side to do this. At his bidding, invisible hands would have removed the stone. But it was to be, be, take, it was to be taken away by human hands. Thus, Christ would show that humanity is to cooperate with divinity. What human power can do, divine power is not summoned to do. God does not dispense with man's aid. He strengthens him, cooperating with him as he uses the powers given him. That's the key. The combination of divine power with human effort. Jesus could have commanded the stone and it would have said, yes, rolled right out of the way. He could have told the angels to remove the stone. But who removed the stone? The people. That's the same concept with you and I. How many of you like to say your prayers at night? I do. But how many of you are real tired at night? And you like to say your prayers like in a kind of not, not really kneeling position, but you're kind of down here on the floor and you're like, dear Jesus. <clears throat> you go to sleep, right? Why doesn't God keep you awake? Because you can do that. The same is true with your devotions. How many of you like to have your devotions in the morning? Now, how many of you don't like to get out of bed because it's really cold? How many of you have actually had your Bible float off the shelf, open up to you, and start reading to you? Never happened to me. Why doesn't it do that? Because you can do that. You can get up and have your devotions. You know, I remember a friend of mine, he said, Tim, it's no use. I said, what do you mean? It doesn't matter what I read in the Bible. I said, really? He's like, I don't retain anything. I like read a passage and I'm like, what did I just read? Has that ever happened to you? And I said, well, keep reading. He's like, but it's not doing anything. My brain is like a colander. He's like, have you ever made spaghetti? You put the noodles in there and you rinse the water through and it just goes right through the holes of the colander. I said, keep reading the Bible because even though the water goes through the colander, it's cleaning the colander. And that's the concept is that you may not be able to retain things right away, but eventually you will. And it's cleaning out that old nature. Eventually this man can memorize large passages from the Bible. Well, I finished up clinic in Peru, and Helen and her family came all the way out to the bus to say goodbye. In fact, this was from the window that I said goodbye. But everyone wants to know now what happened to her. Well, I came back to my hospital, and I shared with my colleagues, the physicians and nurses there, about Helen's condition. Now, the next day, it wasn't a doctor, it wasn't a nurse, but was one of my nurse assistants that came to work with an envelope. And she gave me an envelope full of $1,000 cash. And she said, this is for Helen. I want you to send it to her for her surgery. I sent it to her immediately. She not only had enough money to go from her village to the capital, 
but to see doctors, to be diagnosed, to be treated, and she had enough money left over to go to the Seventh-day Adventist Academy in Peru. She went through her Bible studies in just two weeks, not only because she was a smart young woman, but she had the illustration of salvation written in her heart. If you forget everything that you've just learned in this hour, just remember this final verse. Genesis chapter 22, verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide who? Himself, a lamb for a burnt offering. You see, Abraham was with his son Isaac. And Isaac said, Father, here is the wood, here is the fire, but where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Abraham said with deep significance that God would provide himself as a sacrifice. When you're talking about someone on the transplant list, when your heart is failing and you are hoping and praying that a donor heart will become available, when you are pleading for that new heart, just understand that in order for you to live, it means someone else has to die. The heart that we get is from the donor, Jesus Christ. You see, salvation is free for you and I, but it is very expensive for Jesus Christ. It costs him the second death. It costs him having to be in a human body the rest of his life. It is a gift, a free gift to you and I. But the donor heart comes from God himself. Let's kneel for prayer. Loving Father in heaven, Lord, thank you that you provide the new heart for each one of us. Lord, help us to remember that you're looking for us. Help us to listen. Help us not only to listen, but to respond to you, to come forward, to give you our broken hearts. Not only to give you our hearts, but to listen to your plan, your diagnosis, and your treatment. Lord, let us follow what you tell us to the T. Let us give you 100% as you gave us 100%, knowing that you will do for us what we cannot do for ourselves, but you expect us to do what we can. Lord, I just pray that everyone who can hear my voice will now make a decision for that new heart, not just for this life, but for eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen.